Hi, I'm Liz. And I'm Rhea. Welcome to Karma's My Bitch, a podcast about love, sex, connection, abundance, joy, purpose, peace, and how life isn't simply the stories we tell ourselves. I remember coming into my first session with you Mm -hmm. and you talking about angels and guides and archangels and I still don't think I fully understand it. So can you just explain And today we're just going to scratch the surface of that discussion because otherwise our podcast would be three hours long. (laughs) Angelology, it's a whole field, right? Because a lot of it's just stories. And it's not to say that they're not true stories. It's not to say that people haven't had their own experiences. It's not to dismiss any of that at all. It's really just as we are known to do, expand on it. And part of that is because we actually just need to understand and talk about who are the angels and why they appear in the Bible. Why have we carried on the stories of the angels for such a long time? But they are, for the sake of today's discussion, the most innocent representation of God that we have in our own folklore. In the Bible, the angels are are out doing God's bidding, right? Delivering messages, making sure everybody's doing what they got to be doing, right? They can be taskmasters. They could be warriors. It always, it depends on the story, right? But they are effectively, in the simplest terms, the most innocent representations of God that we have. Innocent, what do you mean by innocent? By innocent, we always see them as when something's angelic, right? I mean, the very word angel sort of has the the immediate depiction and association we have is innocence. And the association we actually... But Satan was was an angel. Yeah, Lucifer. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's the story. The fallen angel story. And demons and stuff. Yeah, because if there's angels, there's demons, right? Only in separation. So, so much of how we understand angelology and the angelic (laughs) realm... What? <laughs> I feel like you're making fun of me. What? <laughs> I don't know. I'm making fun of the guy. It's like, this is the episode about us. <laughs> so we're going to be really like, this is all about us. <laughs> Our time to shine. <laughs> we're going to be really clear about how we talk about this. This is about us. <laughs> and we will finally be understood i did think about it earlier i was like does guy just wants an instagram account <laughs> and i laughed about it earlier myself we would love one raya and you should be in charge of it <laughs> well no because you have to challenge it all i don't know how to do it but okay. yeah guidance council i swear to god we should give them an insta account <laughs> <laughs> okay so for the sake of again our short <laughs> podcast episode the best way i think to understand angels is to understand the, the categories that through which we understand angelology could be sort of seen as how we regard one another, right? And all of the ways in which we are distinct from each other, right? Some are taller, some are bigger, some are stronger, some use their intellect, some are more task oriented. It's more or less how you can sort of categorize the angels. You have domain angels, virtue angels, you have time lords and you have the archangels who, if you were to understand in terms of hierarchies, archangels would be at the very top. Um, so how many angels are there? Oh, thousands, right? Pretty much as much as you can conceive. But there's a hierarchy. So that yes. within angels, there's separation. No, it's not separation. It's just acknowledging, again, like there's no separation really for us humans. There are just ways that make us distinct from one another. But that does not make me better stronger, smarter. Surely an archangel can tell a seraphim what to do. No, because they have their own function and they are very clear about what their purpose is. So if if there is a hierarchy, what are they higher to? Oh, God, source. Okay. Mm-hmm. So archangels are the closest thing to source. Yes. Archangels are source with a voice. Um, yes. They are all aspects of source who were able to exist or, if you will, visit Earth I know this is getting a little woo woo. No, it's fine. But they were the ones that could effectively be emissaries or diplomats for God because God, as source, could not exist in 3D because God cannot exist in a state of separation. Angels could mask themselves, if you will, as in they can match the vibration of separation long enough to do what needs to be done and move on. Uh Angels do not have personalities. Okay. They have distinct qualities qualities if you will but not really they're they don't have personalities they don't have desires 
Obviously, there's no ego. They don't experience a sense of loss. So That's because they're not in separation. Exactly. So they don't understand in many ways. It does not... And not that they lack the compassion for it, but they do not understand grief. They don't understand why we give a shit about certain things. <laughs> They're kind of like, you know what? If you take the bigger perspective like we have over here, you'd be just fine. But that's what's so amazing about expanded consciousness is that when we allow ourselves to really perceive them and connect to them and possibly engage with them through work like, um, like we do, or even through play, with pendulum or if you have your own personal cards it's it's there's so much light when we experience them that there's nothing but joy that results and it's really wonderful yeah you're like that's fine that's very nice Liz. i know i'm just trying to like get my head around it because mm-hmm. for me it's just like a nice story so it is a very nice story but like it's important to understand that a lot of the stories that tend to exist and float around are really human projection right down to the fallen angel story there was no fallen angel. There's not possible. No angel would ever separate like that. It's not, again, that's merely a story to show and make a point about separation. No, angels would never be quote unquote evil, but the perspective that is enabled by having a view into everything means that they can hold space for it all. And so when we, when we look at demons, what we're really seeing are angels with different faces. So for the past 300 years, give or take, but around 300 years, the primary goal and function of an angel is to move humans into 5D consciousness. It's not their job alone. The job is to really assist consciousness, right? They come in the form of nudges and in this kind of joyful, it's all possible kind of way. But that's narrowed humankind's view of angels to the extent where now it's becoming hazardous. I guess it's their occupational hazard. <laughs> right. <laughs> and by the way, they think they're so fucking funny. I know they're really not. I appreciate the occasional pun <laughs> and nerd humor and shit. And I appreciate their tolerance for me and like my awful humor. But they're just really not as funny as they think they are. <laughs> they make me laugh. But whatever. And maybe it's just because like, and I understand this, it's because they... And we synchronize our vibrations to our guides, right? So in some ways, their humor is like meant to match mine. Just like we're all calibrated vibrationally. So like whatever. Can I ask about this or does matching. that not go any So say somebody's engaging in a particular practice. It doesn't even have to be a spiritual one. You're writing a book. You, you're you creating a podcast. You are, you're having a family. You are whatever you are that has to do with you creating and engaging in creation there are angels for that, right? There are guides who assist in that. It's not just sort of you and your human self. You can think that, that's fine. But for anybody who chooses to understand or conceive that there is some other extra connection, whether it be a God connect, angels, whatever, yes, there there is something. Your guides remain the same, but what changes as your evolution continues is your perception of them which will always match your perception of yourself. So their significance to your life, their presence, if you will, the fact that you can even acknowledge that they're there is always reflective of where you are in your evolutionary spectrum. But like, for example, if you talk to my guides, Mm -hmm. do you hear them as me or do you hear them as you? I hear them in their own voice. I do not hear them in your voice. Okay. But I experience them as you because it's your vibration. It's your energy. If they come in in their full power, it would kill me in all likelihood, or it would overwhelm me to the point where I would short circuit. So you have to find a way, and you don't even have to do this consciously. It just happens over time. The more you either channel, the more in the light you sit, maybe the more you work with them, the more you meditate, your vibration and their vibration will start, will come into some sort of harmony. But they are so powerful that they have to be able to lower their, their vibration enough in order to work with us. So can angels tell the future? No, they don't tell the future, but they can see it. And they certainly are better at reading the signs than we are. Why? Because of experience? No, because they don't have attachment. You're not seeing certain things. They see other things, but they may not tell you what those are yet because you got to learn it on your own or you got to be able to experience it. Because the one thing that any guide 
And the same goes for angels as well. They will never fast track you if you really cannot be fast tracked. So they will not give you information that is five steps ahead of your evolutionary capability because it will not make sense because they're not here to fuck with creation, right? They're not, they're here to assist it and they're here to assist the evolution, but they have in the past messed with it, if you will. So let's talk about demons for a moment. And their function. I kind of just feel, yeah, just channel the rest of the episode. <laughs> I'll ask the question when necessary. Exactly. But there was a time when human consciousness needed to understand the lowest of its depths. And that's when you experience the darkest energies. Now, we are not those dark energies, but we can be seen at times as demons. And it's not in that tough love parent way either. It is more the, we will reflect back what you put out. So just as we were explaining that vibrationally, we have to be able to sink in order to be able to serve as guides and be able to function vibrationally on the earth plane, then yes, we will come in as demons. I don't think I understand a demon. I know. Yeah. I think that's what we actually have to explain. Demons can only exist in three-dimensional separation. So because we have that experience of polarity, right? Light, dark. Anything that can exist that comes from the angelic realm can exist in, in completely along that spectrum. If you are in 5D, mm -hmm. you don't experience demons. No, not at all. There's no need to. But again, it's the angelic realm's job or its function to reflect back to humanity the full extent of its expression. What about personal demons? <laughs> Because like you know, we're not responsible for those, Raya. <laughs> no, no, I was wondering. Like you know, you can have personal guides and angels. Can you have personal demons? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, yes, you can technically, yes, but they would not come from the angelic realm. That would be your own shadow. Okay. So what? When you say that angels are here to push upon three D, push us along five D, because if they don't have, it's a very good question, Raya. Yeah. There are three things that we do. <laughs> well, we serve as guides. Right? So we serve as individual guides. That's our primary function. We serve to ensure that there is light and enough light on this planet to enable the evolutionary leap that is required for 5D. So what that means is the moment that darkness starts to loom, so you start to see a region or regions or areas in which there is great strife, a sort of suffering to end all suffering, we will do what we can, however we can to bring light. So the angels really allowed us to bring the concept of heaven to earth and have it mean something. And by heaven to earth, we don't mean in that vertical way, which is the sort of classic Western Judeo Christian concept of God is up, you know, the sort of hierarchy in that vertical God is up in the heavens and we humans are, you know, just down on earth. It's not quite like that. Um, expanded consciousness recognizes that everything exists at one time at the same time, all around us. Our function is no more important than yours. Yours is actually more important than ours. Because, because you are, exactly, you are the one in body. It is possible for angels to assume a human persona. Now, when we say that we've been in human form, we've never walked down the street, but we can certainly appear as humans. And so... Oh, I understand. They do it to serve a purpose, which is to bring heaven to earth or source to the planet. So it would be as if God were walking or we're living and breathing among humans. Conventionally, one might understand a guardian angel is somebody you might have known, right? Like it's possible for a person's guardian angel to be like a dead relative or something. And they, after they've passed over, they want to be part of their guidance council to ensure their physical safety. Because that's all guardian angels are for, are really to ensure our physical safety. So it's kind of like that little warning, that voice that you don't know where it came from that tells you not to cross the street just as the bus is passing. It's much like that, where in a time of danger, should a soul not be ready or should not pass over, we are there. And we will assume a human form for that moment in time. To push them out of the way of the car or whatever. To be a voice. Because they cannot assume a physical action. And is it only ever in life and death situations? We don't like the only and ever statement. Just because, no, 
the reality is that there are times that where it's not necessarily life and death physically, but certainly emotionally and spiritually. So what do they do in those moments? Give you hope. Be that voice of it's possible to get through another day. Everyone is deserving of light. And that's the point is that we are effectively here to serve. And until humanity can come and recognize its own divinity, we have to serve as the divine presence. But as we spend most of our time in our podcast dismantling different concepts around relationship and love and dating and sex and whatever, so spirituality is one of them. And in order to do that, we kind of have to pick apart what are some of the most popular themes. And angelology is one of them. If we're to come into our own growth and evolution and tackle the concepts of what it means to be a divine person or an individual in their own power, right? A fully empowered individual, irrespective of spirituality or whatever, then we need to also tackle the topics like angels. Because right now, in terms of mainstream spirituality, angels are kind of a bullshit concept, right? We see them on Valentine's Day in Judeo-Christianity. It's in the Bible and the stories, you know, the angel this, the angel that. In order to become empowered individuals, people living our purpose, our concepts and ideas need to expand, right? Like we can't just sort of hold on to these like, you know, th this notion that an angel is this like tiny little cherub with an arrow. It doesn't work anymore. Do we need to be scared of angels though? Oh, hell no. We're effectively more powerful for the sake of our growth and evolution. They are not more powerful than we. They just have more at their disposal because their perception. I, I want to say this differently. We're the ones in body. They are not. We're the ones that make the choices. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's their point. And, the, and ultimately, they are not here to interfere. That is certainly part of that divine humanity agreement is the lack of interference. But that's what free will was our ability to choose everything and anything. But now, and as we've discussed, that free will is off the table, they get to be much more present with us should we choose that. And how does that work? That works when we can grasp that they've always been there and they're a part of our lives. Should we just ask for it? The help is there. And we do that through, again, penduluming, meditating, playing with cards, any of the tools that we have at our disposal if we wish. How does one remain in their power yet believe that something out there is not more powerful, but see, you know what I mean? Do, do yeah, it's, it's really understanding that they're not here to interfere. I mean, part of the reason why we, we think that they could be interfering or fearing their interference is because we've already given up something. What do you mean? I really want to do this. Is something going to get in the way? Well, no, of course not. But the moment we start to doubt, the moment we're surrendering our power, the moment we're so uncertain or we're so filled with self-doubt, something could very well happen. And then we think, oh, it was something. It was them. It was interference. Guidance did this. But what was it really? It was you not owning it. Because also I find that like if I, if you give me advice with the pendulum, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. you asked for it. Because I asked for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I take it. Or if I ask my own pendulum mm -hmm. or whatever else. I've always thought of it as kind of using it as a tool to connect to my own knowing, my own intuition. Right? Yes, that's true. But if I think about it in terms of someone else can see more mm -hmm. and is giving me advice, mm -hmm. I feel like my power goes. Everybody, like almost everybody does, but they're often asking, first of all, because their they're uncertainty shows where they're not in their power. Okay. Quite simply, if all they really wanted was clarity, the answer would not throw them off. It would often make them more certain of the decision they've already made. If somehow the answer presents something they hadn't already considered, it could be that they hadn't seen the bigger picture. And that's okay. Some people just need to take a step back. Either because they're too emotionally tied to something that they just couldn't see it for really what it was. But I've often found in my work that the answer people get. And this is really just in a talk about guides. So this, again, it really doesn't have to do with angels. I find that the advice or the message is fairly gentle. It's okay. never absolute okay. in that respect, right? It's the, could you consider this another way? Okay. But it is never, it is never, and this is how you know where it's coming from. And you know that it's of a higher vibration. 
it's never going to tell you to go hurt yourself. It's never going to send the message that is somehow going to bring you lower. They are here always for light. We can't fully grasp the extent of who they really are if we can't grasp who we really are and our most divine selves. And so we've been sort of spoon fed throughout the ages, more palatable versions of the divine in order to make sense of who they are. But as we begin to see ourselves as bigger, more powerful individuals, that has to sync up with how we see everything else. And if we can own that divinity or that power, we can also begin to accept the fact that they are also just as powerful as they really are, right? If we can conceive of that, then they can actually really be able to be more present and with us. And what is them being more present in low? Accessing them much more regularly, because that would really help us plant more light in the world. Thank you for listening. For more information, articles, and inspiration, find us at karmasmybitch.com and at karmasmybitch.insta. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. 